If you have missed a week or two, um, it's important to let you know that we're teaching through a series which I've called The Power of the Cross, especially as we come up to Easter, which is very soon now. And last week and this, I'm speaking on the same subject, the bloodline. In Corinthians, the Apostle Paul speaks about a mystery. And he describes the amazing gospel of Jesus Christ as a mystery. We learned that the word mystery from the Greek means a sacred secret. Something hidden. And we would ask, who was it hidden from? First and foremost, it was hidden from the devil, from principalities and powers. So God was unfolding and unpacking through the history of time, down through the ages. God was preparing a moment when Jesus himself would come. And we learn, even in the Old Testament, that Jesus was destined to be crucified. Now, it was all portrayed and written, but not understood until it happened. Even his disciples didn't understand what was happening the moment it was happening. But once it took place, it was like an event that had begun that could never be stopped. And Paul talks about this secret this sacred secret that had been hidden. But that verse in Corinthians also tells us this. But this sacred secret is now being revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we need the Holy Spirit today. You need the Holy Spirit today to reveal to us the most precious message anybody can ever hear on planet Earth. And I want to tell you that this message doesn't only get you to heaven. This message brings heaven to your earth now. It changes your circumstances and your situation once you understand it, put your faith into it, and walk in it. That is the truth. And it's also important to say, and most people know this, but perhaps you don't, so I don't assume, the Bible is God's word, and it's got two halves, one half bigger than the other, so they're not equal size. We call it the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, the New Testament or the New Covenant. All of it is about Jesus and the cross and what he accomplished, even though he doesn't actually appear till the New Testament. But all the stories in the Old Testament, such as the one that Jacob read for us today, is actually an illustration, a visual aid, a shadow of a real thing that was to come, which is why we've been looking at Old Testament stories to discover New Testament truth. It helps us see in a real way the things that God wants us to understand. Now we pointed out, and I'd like to repeat, that last week we saw these verses, listen carefully, Romans 5 verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, doesn't say his death. We then read in Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. Why is it making the point, the blood, instead of the cross or his death? We could read on, Colossians 1.20 says, having made peace through the blood of the cross. And then a beautiful promise in Revelation 12 verse 11, they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The Bible is forensic in detail. Every last word is in there because the Holy Spirit intended it to be so. That's why we can give our lives to study in the Word of God and never get to the bottom of it. And as we're looking into it, we notice it doesn't just say his death or the cross, it's pointing specifically to the blood of Jesus Christ. And today we're looking at another story about the blood of Jesus. And it's interesting that this story that was read for us 
also focuses around a prostitute. We've had one story already about a prostitute. Do you remember that? We talked about the prophet Hosea. And God told Hosea to go down to the red light of his city and marry a prostitute. Remember that? She was called Goma. So he does. They have kids. They're happily married for a while. And then she returns to a prostitution. Worse still, life gets so bad she's sold into slavery. But God says to Hosea, go and buy her back. And he goes down to the slave market and buys back his own wife. And we discover the incredible grace of God in the way he redeems and ransoms us from a messed up life of sin and destruction and darkness and futility. And I, I just think it's remarkable. I, I actually do think it's truly remarkable that when God wants to reveal to us the greatest story ever told, he doesn't take the princesses and the queens and the kings, he takes the prostitutes to tell us about his love and his grace. No one is beyond the reach of God's love, Amen. including you. And so, what do we see in this story? Well, we notice, first of all, it was a significant time. It was a significant time from two directions. First of all, it was a significant time for the children of Israel, because after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the time had come to take the promised land. Yay! And they were on an adventure with God. They were crossing over, as we spoke about yesterday. But it was also a time of fulfillment of the judgment of God. Jericho was the first city that they had to bypass or get through or go beyond to take the promised land. And it was a hugely fortified city with big, thick walls. But when you go back to Genesis... Chapter 15, God speaks to Abraham and he says, these people I will judge. And the judgment was coming because firstly, they were worshipping idols, but not just any old idols. These idols demanded child sacrifice. And so they were sacrificing their own children and the land was filled with the bloodshed of the innocents. This idolatry that they were into was hallmarked by raging sexual immorality. The temples had temple prostitutes. And the gods they worshipped, they thought to be fertility gods. So part of the worship was orgies. And so prostitution was a part of a sacred life for them. And the spin-off of all of this was violence and destruction. And God said, one day, the judgment is going to come. So two things are colliding. The history and the destiny of God's people to take the promised land and the time of judgment on the people of Jericho. And so if you like, God had a laser beam. And he was focusing it into the city of Jericho for judgment. Not only that, his laser beam was fine-tuned because there was a particular part of this city that he was going to target in the first instance, which were the city walls. This is where the action was going to happen. And we read of a story of a woman who was a prostitute whose house was in the walls, the bullseye, the laser beam, the target of God's judgment. If there was some place you wanted to live on earth right then, it would not be there. And so that story that we've read opens up at a significant point in history. And this lady... This prostitute, she's named. Her name's Rahab. 
And her response, her reactions, her initiative is so significant that God himself says, that's amazing. God calls her out as amazing in the New Testament. And not only that, she appears in two of the most famous halls of fames that you could find in the New Testament. She turns up first in Matthew chapter 1, and there you find her, this prostitute, Rahab, in Jesus' family tree. You know, the woman whose house was in the wall, the laser beam was about to blow it to pieces, this lady. And then we come into Hebrews, that famous chapter, chapter 11, of everybody who lived by faith, she's right in there. So what went on in this story that marked this woman out as so different and brought her to a place where it's life-changing, history-making, well, the first thing we discover is this, that although there was no internet and there were no newspapers, Ray had plenty of male visitors, right? They all just kept coming to her house. And every time they came, they brought with her, or brought with them, a message. Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard about Israel? Have you heard about what God has done for them? Have, have you heard how they defeated those two powerful kings? Have, have you heard how they crossed the Red Sea? Have, have you heard how God supernaturally provided for them in the wilderness? Have you heard how God has promised them this city and this land? And have you heard they're about to arrive? And so this news reached Rahab. And the Bible tells us that she says she and her family and everybody else around her was terrified. The fear of God had already fallen upon them. But then, in the providence of God, and sometimes we don't, recognize the providence of God till later. I love joining up the dots. And you see how God stepped into your life. Remember as a kid, you used to you know, join the dots? And then the picture would emerge? That's how God works with us. That somehow, a guy from Timishwara ends up in Glasgow and has an encounter with God and somehow goes back and now there's a church. How do all these dots join together? I grew up in Wales. I married a girl from West Yorkshire and Scotland's my home. How did that happen? <laughs> God's involved with your life even before you find him. And he's searching for you. And the goodness of God is calling you and reaching you and wanting to pull you constantly into his destiny. In this lady's life, Joshua finds himself in a deja vu moment. Forty years before, he had been sent in as a spy into this land. He had seen the cities and the fortified walls and the exceptionally large people that lived in it. And his heart had become excited that this is the land that God's giving to us. But he got outvoted. Him and Caleb voted, let's take it. Two said yes and ten said no. And the ten who said no put the fear into the rest of them. And so they've had to wander around the wilderness for 40 years. So Joshua says, well, I ain't sending in ten spies. I'm just going to send in two. And he didn't even announce to the children of Israel that he was doing this. It was a secret. But they go in and they spy out the land and they, they look at the city and they get a, a recce of it all. And then the king of the city, which is a city-state, 
Shears, they're about to start searching for them, so they take cover in the prostitute's house, because guys are going in and out all the time, they wouldn't be so noticeable, and she tells them, we've heard about you, and we know what God is going to do. And the remarkable thing with this lady is, instead of choosing to go with the fear of all the people around her, she moves out in faith, and she says, I'm going to trust the God that sent you. I'm going to trust the God that's behind you. I'm going to trust the God that's above you and clearly he's beneath you. I want to be a part of what you've got. And if I hide you and protect you, will you do something for me in return and preserve me, my father, my mother, my, my brothers, my sisters, everything we've got? And this deal is struck. And the Bible says that she hid them on the roof of a house. And of course, all their houses had flat roofs. And on their flat roof, they would dry the flax and the, the wheat for the day and hid them underneath it and when the search party had passed she lets them out through the window and they escape until the moment comes of arrival but this is what she said to them I want you to notice this because it is so so important that you will show kindness say kindness, kindness. and to my father's house and give me a true token that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brother and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. We have an English version, right, or a Romanian version. And so sometimes we miss what's actually being said. There is the most awesome, beautiful word used. When she says this, will you show me kindness? It's not, the word isn't, will you show me a favor? Will you do me a turn? This is the word, this is the Hebrew word she uses. Will you show me chesed? Now chesed is one of the most beautiful words in the Old Testament. Because chesed is a covenant word. And chesed is a word, if you were to translate it, the best translation is loving kindness. And it frequently shows up in the Psalms as love and kindness, his love and kindness, his love and kindness, his love and kindness. And it's not just being kind, you know, you do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. Chesed, chesed, love, chesed kindness is when you do something for somebody that doesn't deserve it at all, they cannot possibly return the favor and they cannot do anything to bless you back it's actually throwing yourself at someone's mercy and say would you show me chesed and what she was saying is I know this city is doomed for destruction and I know I'm a prostitute living in the city wall I've got nothing that I can bring to the deal at this table but would you show me chesed would you show me chesed? Mercy. Would you show me mercy? Would you show me mercy and my family mercy? Would, would you show me that kind of goodness? Save me from the destruction that's coming? And when, whenever we see that word in the Old Testament, we, it, it needs to trigger in our mind covenant. It, it needs to trigger in our mind incredible grace. It needs to trigger in mind God's goodness to the most undeserving. And this is what she's asking for. And so, the spies understood the depth of a request. They didn't just see it as, oh, we'll do you a favor. They saw it as, we are entering we are entering into a covenant with this lady because they promised the covenant on their own blood. They, were, they began to speak back to her in covenant language. And we don't take covenant too seriously these days. You know, everything's got to be signed in ink. They used to sign it in blood. When you made an agreement in days gone by, it was a pain of death that you would keep your word. And so they, they say back to her, they talk to her, and they say, it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of your house and into the street, his blood, 
His blood will be upon his own head. And we will be guiltless. But if he stays in your house, under this covering, in this place, his blood will be upon our heads. We're entering into a covenant, a chesed relationship, a chesed response to here. And so she also asks for something. She says, would you give me, this is what she says, would you give me a true token that this will be so? And they gave her a token. They said to her, okay, this is what you are to do. You are to take a scarlet red rope and you are to hang it out of your window and it marks out your house. So when the moment comes, you're under the red line. And anybody who's in that house is safe. And of course, we remember from last week when she asked for a true token that God spoke about the Passover lamb being a true token. This is what we read last week. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be a sign for you. Where you live, it will be a token, the King James Version says, upon the house. When I see the blood, I will pass over. These spies are young men. They were born in the wilderness because all their parents died. But they'll have heard the story of the blood over the house. They didn't have a lamb, so they said to this woman, put a red line outside your window and you will be saved. The interesting thing is that on the night that Jesus himself was betrayed which was Passover it was the Passover date the Passover night he said this this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins and in, in one of the gospels Jesus says this I've eagerly waited for this moment to share this bread and wine with you. How long do you think he'd been waiting? The week? Well, they got the Passover ready? The month? I think he'd been waiting from before the world began. I've been eagerly waiting. And this blood, this wine, is the blood of the new covenant shed for you it's chesed it's God's undeserved mercy when we can bring nothing to the table to save ourselves the blood forgives us redeems us ransoms us sets us free brings us through into every good thing that God has got for us but what I want you to see here the blood is heard and seen by God because the judgment that was coming didn't, super, didn't happen naturally. It was a supernatural thing, right? Remember the story? God gives them a strategy how to take the city. How do they do it? They're told to send the priests around the city walls 13 times. Unlucky for some. And they go once each day for six days. And on the seventh day, they go seven times. And on the last one, Joshua says, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So they shout and blow a trumpet. And the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, apart from one little bit. A precision incision the bloodline protects and everything else fell I wish I'd seen that I hope God kept a video of it because one day I'm going to say Lord let me see that 
the whole thing collapses apart from her house, the prostitute's house, the least deserving. And the Bible says everybody in her house, she'd brought in a father, it says, a mother, her brothers, and a sister. She had no husband to bring in. But everybody else came in. And do you know what it also says? Even the things were saved. Joshua 2.13, and that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have. So, I don't know what that house looked like on that day, but I bet they'd rammed it full. <laughs> and there they were. And the story goes on to tell us that in the moment that it happened, they were preserved. The two spies were sent specifically to get her and her family out. They were taken outside, away from the city, to a place of safety. And God's judgment continued. And it's amazing how once our hearts turn to faith and throw ourselves on God's chesed love, everything in our lives has been raised in the twin towers of hard work and self-effort. We feel God will only do something for us if we do something back. God, I promise to be a better person. I'll stop the drugs and the smoking and the sleeping about. I'll stop everything. But we have to come as we are and throw ourselves on God's mercy. Show me chesed love. And you know what? He loves to. The other interesting thing about this lady is not only did she go from fear to faith, she went from four to family. She was in the crosshairs of the judgment of God. But she ends up in the heart of the community. That bloodline that marked out her house didn't only save her, it opened the very way for her into everything God had. Exactly the same way the blood of Jesus has done for us. In Ephesians 2.13 it says, but now you... Now, do you know me say, he's talking to you. You have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you are far away from God, but now you, that's right, you, have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. And so it goes on in Hebrews 10. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This lady, the prostitute, Rahab, is first rescued and redeemed and brought into the family. Then she marries a guy called Salmon. Tradition says, historians even say, it's not actually said in the Bible, but people think Salmon was one of the two spies. So she marries this guy. And the Bible says she goes on to have kids. They have family together now. And uh, as they get married, they have a son called Boaz. And when Boaz is introduced to us, he's a very, very wealthy man. Very wealthy man. So the prostitute gets redeemed, comes into a family, she's rescued and blessed. And the kids are now blessed. And then Boaz marries an alien woman called... Ruth and the beautiful story of Ruth all spins around a wonderful word chesed she didn't deserve anything she was a Moabitess but God shows her chesed love and kindness covenant love so the young widow is what she was who's it's so poor She's begging in the fields. 
marries the prostitute's son, Boaz, and they become the lord and lady of the manor. And God blesses them. So, covenant love starts, but it goes from one generation to the next generation. And Boaz and Ruth had a son, and his name was Jesse. And Jesse had a son, and his name was David. And David, in those 150, 150 Psalms, is the person in the Bible who uses the word chesed the most. The love and kindness of God endures forever. I bet he heard a story about his great-great-grandmother. When I was a kid, my gra- I remember my grandmother, she was always, was always old. See, she always looked old. She was old. But I remember when she was in her 80s, she was losing her sight. I had an assignment from school, follow your family tree. And of course, when I was a kid, right, there was no internet. There was electricity. <laughs> Contrary to what my kids sometimes used to think. And so my grandmother was able to go back to the 1600s, who her parents were and their parents. And I remember doing this family tree. But can you imagine David having his family tree? The David who had been forgotten by his own father when the prophet came to town. Mike, you know, it wouldn't be great to say, you know, well, my dad's Bill Gates. You know, or, or, my, or my dad's King Charles. David was able to say, well, my great great grandmother was a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> but she found Chesed, the grace and the mercy of God. And it endures forever and ever and ever and ever. And the great great grandson of the prostitute became the greatest king Israel ever had. Draw the bloodline around your family. So if you're a mum and the kids are estranged, get the bloodline moving. And your kids' kids, grandkids, and your great grandkids, it endures from generation to generation. Do we have this expectation? Of what Jesus has really done for us. And you know what? In New Testament times, as Jesus was being crucified, the holiest place then was the temple. It's called Herod's Temple. It was a magnificent structure. Magnificent. It had the holiest place of all, where the presence of God was said to be. But the ordinary were kept out through a curtain now it wasn't like a curtain you get from Ikea this curtain was 60 foot high 20 foot wide and the fabric was 4 inches thick and it was said by Josephus a historian of the time that even if you'd put horses one side of the curtain and one the other they would never have been able to rip it apart The holy place was shut tight. But on the day Jesus was crucified, the Bible says the curtain was ripped from the top to the bottom, and it was opened up. Just like Rahab came into the very center of what God was doing, You and I have come right into the very center of God's presence. And it wasn't really the curtain that counted. That was just a symbol and symbolic. The real curtain that was ripped was the body of Jesus Christ. It was ripped open so that you could come right into the presence of God. That you could come right in. And Martin Luther, that great reformer of 500 years ago, used to say this. Come boldly to the throne of God or don't bother coming at all. Because you can come 
right into God's presence. Do you know, I used to think it was like this, right? You become a Christian through grace. You get saved because you can't save yourself. And in my mind, as I, I imagined I came from a country of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, and I crossed the border with now my new passport of salvation into the kingdom of God. And I think, thank God I'm saved. But I would imagine that God lives in a palace in a throne room somewhere in the middle of this country. And for me now to get to him, boy, I better try really hard and become a very good Christian. And it always seems like God was a million miles away. But the same grace that gets you over the border gets you into the heart, into the throne room. Amen. That's the privilege we have. When we had one of our first offices, which was down the road in Royal Exchange Square, we had no staff in those days and we had to do everything. And so if people came to see me as a pastor, I would make them the tea and the coffee. And I had a fridge in my office. You like a cold drink? Can of Coke. Well, my kids would come and I might be seeing somebody. They'd just walk in. Hi, Dad. they go to the fridge, grab a can of Coke. Bye, Dad. I walk out the door. <laughs> and I'm in some serious counseling with somebody. We can walk right into the presence of God. We can walk right in. And all the privileges and the prerogatives and the rights, all because of chesed love. Draw the bloodline around your house. Not only did she go from four to family, she went from failure to her future. She went from a red light district to a green light district. She went from destruction to destiny. She went from futility to fruitfulness. Rahab survived. She entered into the promised land, but even more than that, she didn't just enter into the promised land, she entered into the promise. And Jesus' own lineage comes from her. It's important for us to understand. Listen, we'll unpack this again. God didn't call Israel out of Egypt to come to the promised land to eat big fat grapes, build big houses, and become expert farmers. That wasn't the th reason behind it. The reason behind it was this. He called them out so that he could have a face to face with them. When he sent Moses into Egypt to get them out, he was told to tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they might worship me. Too often we focus on the fat grapes and forget the face to face, the privilege we have with God. We need to understand that the blood, the bloodline accomplishes two things. We only tend to see it from one perspective. We see what God has done for us. We, talk, we call it redemption. God has given us back what man has lost. And that's where we tend to live. But you know God lost something? And God is getting back what he lost. We call that restoration. What did God lose? I tell you what God lost. A man and a woman on the earth representing him. Submitting to his authority, doing his will, walking in his ways. That's what he lost. He, he, although the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, he lost, he, 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 he lost the person that he put in place to run the planet. And guess what's happening through the bloodline? He's bringing back the people to run the planet. God is restoring. He's redeemed me. But he's restoring what he's lost. God has got a people rising up in the earth called the church. And we are here to move with authority and with power. In our prayers and with our faith. With our testimony. They overcame with the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So God sows you into the university. And he sows you into the laboratory. And he sows you into the hospital. And he sows you into the school. Why? With your testimony. So that you can be a representative of God Almighty. That you can walk as a son and a daughter of the king. That you can walk in there. I'm doing God's business. It's his will be done. Not my will be done. And I'm going to bring in the kingdom rule of God. I'm going to bring in the justice of God. And the righteousness of God. The healing power of God, the peace of God and the faith of God may start in my family but may come into the street. That's what God is doing all because of the bloodline. All because of the bloodline. And you know what? 
We started out talking about the sacred secret, the mystery. When the devil caused the nailing of Jesus to the cross, he thought, that man's finished. That is what he thought. But what he didn't realize, that the cross was a hinge that opened up a door that led many sons and daughters to glory. He killed one, but released millions. The devil thought that he'd stopped it all, but instead, he actually pressed the button that started a process that no man, devil, or principality can stop. No one can stop it. And as it's unfolding and unpacking, it's caught us up in it. And so we pray, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, somebody, give the Lord a round of applause in this place. Pray the blood. Old timers used to talk about pleading the blood. Plea, a plea is what a lawyer makes, right? So what, what you do is you say, Lord, the blood of Jesus has redeemed me and ransomed me. And by the way, it's over my house and everything in it. So as you walk, you're walking under that bloodline. It has to start somewhere. You have to come under it. Rahab made a choice, right? She made a choice to put a confidence in it. Maybe you need to make that choice today. Are you ready, if you haven't done so, to put your life into Christ? His blood was shed to forgive you, cleanse you, bring you home to God your Father. That blood breaks every curse. I don't care what which doctor has said, or what voodoo practice has taken place. Nothing can stick to you when you're under the blood. No weapon forged against you can ever prosper. It can never prosper. But you need to put your life under that blood. We used to sing a hymn, maybe we should bring it back. There is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins. And guilty sinners plunge deep within and lose all their guilty stains. You're ready to give your life to Jesus today. Don't delay. You know you can go to church all your life and still not be saved. We were at my aunt's funeral a few weeks ago, 101. Came to know Jesus at 96. Phew, she left it close. <laughs> but boy, did she get saved when she did. Don't leave it. I read a story this week about the evangelist D.L. Moody. He looked like this. We got a picture of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody came to Glasgow many times. He actually started a Bible college which ran for 123 years before it closed. It was across the road when it did close. And we've picked up its legacy at Destiny College. But D.L. Moody was a very powerful evangelist. And one night, he was in his church in Chicago. The year was 1871. This is a true story. He was in Chicago in 1871 in a meeting just like this. And he made the same altar call opportunity that I've just made. Would you like to give your life to Jesus? But he felt that the call was so urgent and so important, I should say, that he wanted people to think about it. You can play. <laughs> he wanted people to think about it. And so when he said, would you like to give your life to Jesus? Would you like to come under that blood? I want you to think about it for this next week. And if you want to, come back next week and make a decision. Well, as he was making that altar call, there was the sound of horse-drawn fire engines outside rushing past his building. And in Chicago, on that very night, 
in that very moment, the great fire of Chicago started. And it burnt the city to the ground, including the next day, spurred, uh, Moody's own church building. Nearly everybody who had been in that room that night died before the next Sunday. Moody wrote about this and said, I will never forgive myself for this. He became very sick. He kept coming back to the grace of God. But it permanently marked his life. I can't promise you next Sunday. What I can promise you is right this moment. We call it the present. That's why it's a gift from God. And in the event that there is somebody here today, don't delay. Be sure. Be certain. Give your life to Christ. Let's pray together. God's in the house. I'm overwhelmed by the chesed love, the amazing grace of God. He takes the unknown, the undeserving, those who are not famous, those who have nothing, and when they trust him, his bloodline comes to them. Because of it, we draw close. We can have a face-to-face -face with God. And in the event there's somebody here today, and you know you need to be right with God. You need to give your life to Him. I'm not talking about being religious. I'm not talking about just believing in Him. I'm talking about, here's my life, Lord. I'm taking confidence in that precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's what's cleansing me. It's what's saving me. It's what's bringing me close today. It's what's releasing the blessing of God. That and no other thing is releasing the blessing of God on my life today. And if that is you and you need to know Jesus, would you allow me to pray for you as we wrap up here? I want to pray for you. And I know that when I pray, God does hear and things do happen. And your life will change and God will come in. In any event, there's somebody. And you know you need this prayer. I'm going to ask you to do a very simple thing. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. If you need this prayer right now, would you? Would you? Just raise your hand in the air. And then when I've seen it, you can put it back down again. And then we'll pray together. So if you need this prayer, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, this is a moment for you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else? Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anybody else in this room today? Thank you. Thank you. I see your hands as well. I know there's others in this room today. I cannot promise you next week, but I know God is here right now and he wants to meet with you and love you and bring you into his family. Is there somebody else? Raise your hand with me if there is, and then we're going to pray. Just lift your hand. That's all you've got to do. We're going to pray for you together. Is there somebody else? You know what? They'll be asking in the kids' room as well. They'll be asking with those guys the same question today. Is there somebody else? Don't delay. Don't be nervous. Don't be anxious. Reach and say, God, I need your chesed love. I see your hand. Is there somebody else? Let's pray. Thank you. And I see yours as well. God is here. We're aware of him, right? His love is right here. Is there somebody else before we pray? Raise your hand if there is. This is a beautiful day to come to know God. Then let's pray together. <laughs> if you raised your hand while we pray, would you raise your hand again? Imagine you're reaching up into heaven, saying, God, I'm here. I'm here. Just raise your hand again while we pray. Father, I'm praying for every person that's raised their hand today. You know them passionately. You love them deeply. Lord, you know every 
detail about their lives. You know what they've done and what's been done to them. But you are stepping in today and we call on you. Save them. Let them know your chesed love, your covenant love, that loving kindness today. The loving kindness that sent Jesus to the cross. Lord, we put them under the blood of Jesus Christ and we call out forgiveness and cleansing in his name and through his blood. Lord, I pray that you'll fill them really soon with your Holy Spirit. Help them walk into every good thing. We promise as a church to help in all and every way we can to take them forward in the good things that you have for them. Great grace on them in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Come on, let's welcome these beautiful people into the family of God.